are streaming it says so i am streaming dave here how are you how has your week been mine has been busy 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 now today on the show we're going to do a couple of things first thing i need is to say good day to a few people hello there everyone uh dr horn swaggle and leroy oh sorry lenny rosa what i'm going to do is i'm going to switch this uh, screen here so that we're not downloading as well as pushing up and that should keep it nice and clean for you there we go that's all done and i have this is just a little bit of uh, housekeeping i have to do right at the beginning of the stream now can you hear me can you see me i'm hoping so graham Searle. i saw, just saw you pop in say good day when someone says yes everything's good i'll keep going with it so hopefully we are streaming well good evening everyone from jay para i'm hoping you can see me good evening dave from Stu in Asheville. and well yes 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 all right i haven't seen anyone put a comment up yet that they can see me need to see that if someone could do that that'd be lovely uh all good excellent thank you so much thank you all good i can get into it now now as i say at the beginning of every show we're probably be doing it anywhere between 10 minutes to half an hour of chat at the beginning i will be doing some viewers projects this week and we've got some really nice ones not saying that the other ones aren't but there's some interesting stuff that has been made by viewers and they've sent a couple of photos in for me to to share with you guys now, what have I got written here? This is my little run sheet again. Uh, okay, check the streams running. Well, yes, say hello to everyone. Hello. Um, keep the channel afloat in the descriptions box below. There's some links there. And I've actually built a links page. That's always fun. I do a little bit of web development as well. So I've got a page there that links for USA um, to a whole heap of Festool and a whole heap of Craig. And also on the same page is the, a link to my MITRE set uh, affiliation and also the Stanton bench. And if you saw the video I did on the weekend, which I released last night, on the garden shelf, you'll see how versatile this bench is. I, the more I use it, the more I love it. So if you want one, go ahead and grab the plants. Let me see what's the next thing. Um, photos from where you're watching or projects you are building your own shop, also animals in the shop. So let's jump straight into an animals in the shop there from Debbie. And here it is. So you're famous right at the beginning of the show there, Debbie. Uh, morning, Dave. Just thought I would share a pic. My little girl, Riff, isn't that impressed with me watching videos while she's trying to sleep? That's the cat in the foreground there. Uh, maybe she'd be more interested if it was a very video. I'm getting closer to being able to start making my Stanton bench. Nearly got enough room in the shed, so I thought I would do a refresher while waiting for the live stream. Good on you. So that's Zane S. Acker. Debbie. All right. We shall switch back over to this image here, uh, which is my handsome self. <laughs> uh, you got to have tickets on yourself, haven't you? Someone's got to say it. I need to tick that one off. And today also what we're going to do, that one's gone. Get back to my run sheet. Um, the video on the floating shelf, that was fun. Now, I've had some comment. One gentleman said, uh, Dave, this, I can't tell whether you're taking the piss or whether you're serious. You have gone over the top as far as that uh, shelf is concerned. He's a utilitarian kind of a character. And he says, you know, um, if, if, the job, if, the, if the item does the job, there's no need to make it any better than it actually needs to be. And I get, I get your point. But what I'm trying to do with my videos is also encourage people to try and go beyond, do that little bit extra, have some fun and see the capacity, see the capabilities that are there. You know, all you got to do is use a little bit of this gray stuff up here or here <laughs> and uh, and focus on what you're doing. And as I say to people a lot, I'll jump in a bathtub and with a glass of port. And I'll lie there in the lovely warm water, having a port, and that's where I do my best thinking. Now, I'm not suggesting to kids under 18 to do that. Maybe a glass of lemonade. But uh, I, I really enjoy trying to just take it that little bit further. And that floating shelf has worked so, so well. And it has addressed a couple of things for me. And uh, I mentioned to my wife, she said, you know, I hate it. 
<laughs> I said, she, well, she did, pardon me. She didn't actually say I hate it, but she, she implied that she wasn't very fond of it. And she said, it's just, this is something that a field independent person would do. You don't want, you should, I would just look for somewhere to put the cup, probably on the ground. Well, you know, I go through the reasons why I didn't put the cup on the ground. Uh, I don't want Barry coming over and starting to drink the coffee out of it or drinking my beer. He's fond of beer. Having said that, I don't give him a heap of beer. Just every now and then he gets a little sip. And uh, so there you go. If you're a field dependent person, you may not want that shelf. <laughs> All right. What's the next thing? What's the next thing? Uh, where did I get my bench tops from? I'll read that one straight away. So that's from Roger DeBolt. Now, Roger has said, Hi, Dave. I'm a beginning woodworker and I came across your videos and I'm now addicted to them. <laughs> uh, you keep it real and entertaining. I'm making the third bay in my three gar garage my workshop and I'm buying tools on a regular basis to get started. My question is about your immaculate shop. It is the shop of my dreams. <laughs> Thanks, Derek. Oh, Roger, I should say. Derek's the next good person. Um, I have 29 foot wall that I'd like to make your, uh, your Midas uh, saw bench. I just purchased the CapEx 120 and now looking to get a good setup for it. What are the dimensions of your work area? Are your tops pre-made or are you laminating them yourself? You have many videos out there about them, but I have not come across them yet. If you do, uh, I, I like the round over edges and the granite look. What would uh, you change about it, if anything? If any help or suggestions would be greatly appreciated. Thanks, Roger. Okay, Roger and anyone who's, else who's uh, wondering about these tops here, what he's talking about here. These are laminate tops that I had manufactured. Now, I don't have the capacity to put that round on. So it's got a round, eight millimeter round at the top and at the bottom. These are, I think, 38 millimeters thick, very close to it, standard bench top thickness for a kitchen. Underneath them is a melamine finish as well. So it's not exposed particle board underneath. If it was, it would absorb and release moisture and it would cup all over the place. So I made sure that all edges are sealed, either by melamine or by this. If I cut any of the edges, I painted them with Estopol just to make sure that they weren't, um, they weren't going to absorb moisture and, and affect the, the, the substrate. Uh, having said that, now would I do it again? Yes, I would, in a heartbeat. The reason being, they look, they were expensive. I know that and I was almost going to do all of the tops out of form ply. But form ply is very dark and I wanted something that was going to be light, reflecting the surfaces. I saw a few granite tops in the States when I was watching early days with uh, the Wood Whisperer. Some of his um, viewers workshops that were sent in, I, I loved watching those things. And I was gleaning as much information as I could. And these granite outfeed tables around the, and even the granite tops for table saws, I was amazed. You know, I thought, I've got to have something like that. But it wasn't available to me, so I went the next best. I went with a laminate surface. I am very, very careful with the laminate surfaces. That's one of the reasons I made this Stanton bench, so that I can do all the, the nasty, you know, cutting and all that stuff up there, not here on the laminate tops. If I've got to thump things, I go down to Arthur's workbench down the end there, which is a big, heavy carpenter's bench, and I, I can smash around things on that and it's not going to worry it. But the laminate tops are extremely forgiving as far as glues are concerned. I can normally get rid of a glue off the top so I don't have to be so fussed when I'm doing a glue up on it. The glue can drop. I leave it there. I just get a plain blade, an old plain blade, and I scrape the, the glue off and it pops off really easy. The only thing that wouldn't come off would probably be some of the polyurethanes or some of the epoxies. But with my Type 1 glues, it's normally fine. It's a nice, clean, slippery surface for the outfeed tables on around the table saw. It's a good slippery surface for here, for when I'm sliding timber down past the capex, which normally lives there. You know, it's a whole lot uh, stronger than just a sheet of melamine. Melamine breaks up easily. It's not very impact resistant. This is impact resistant to a certain point, but not a heap. So there you go. That's I'm hoping that's answered your question there, Roger. Would I do it again? Yes. And for people in Australia, I went to Laminex Industries out of Prospect, that's in New South Wales, and I had a chat to them there. They sent me a form that I had to fill in, and I went through that form and I told them all the details I wanted. I wanted chamfered corners on each corner, so I couldn't catch my hip on them. The double round, and they came back to me and said, we can only do it on 
to edge estate. We can't do it on all four. And the thing is, I got back to him and said, well, you've done it for me before on all four edges. So can you go back and check another joiner shop? So I think what they do is they, they go and check with the joiner shop and they, they sub all their work out to, a, to them. And there's different shops around. So they had a bit of a hunt round and they came back to me and said, yes, we can do it for you, not a problem. So if you're in Australia, hopefully that helps. I think Laminex Industries has an office or an outlet in each state. Bit of coffee. So there we go. I will tick Roger's thing off the list there. And the next thing we will have a look at is, I'll do a quick read on the chat. Dear me, look at all this chat. There's a heap of it there. Now I'm not gonna, I'm, I'm, give me a second here. I'm gonna read through it. I'm not gonna call it out. And this is gonna be boring for you guys. I'm just scamming, skimming, not scamming, I'm skimming through to see if there's any questions about something pertinent to what I've been talking about or a question about something that I can help them out with. Uh, nice haircut. <laughs> yeah, I economize. You know, you get, uh, I should stop saying you know. I, I pick up sayings and I stick with them for a month or two and I have to beat myself out of it. So haircut. I'm a bit of a tight ass. So I, when I see the barber, I say, uh, I, I don't want to come back next month. So make this a two month haircut. So there you go. He takes a bit more off and uh, I don't mind it. The thing is, there's less hair now to cut than there was before. Maybe I should get a discount. I don't know. Uh, sound and looking good. Hi from Wagga. Uh, still reading through, down through here, long staffs of country. Uh, Durham. Uh, Richard, I am going to do a little section on your uh, cabinet, your bookshelf that you made. So Richard Longstaff, who's there in the chat, he's made this beautiful bookshelf with a nice uh, coving section around the top and he's done it all on his table saw so I will show you some pictures of that as well very very soon uh, Terry first time here from Tucson he said enjoy the shows thanks that's fine Ian uh, I have you running on the phone while I'm fitting tiles in the kitchen multitasking at its best good on you Ian John Lafferty good morning how are you uh, still reading through still reading through uh, just stumbled across your channel. This is from up goes the size of the chat box so I can see it. <laughs> One of the things about getting old. Um, from Shane's main shop. There you go. Brian Shaw, morning from Sydney. Evening, Dave and other guys and gals from Florida. Okay. Take it all off, Peter. Take it all off. No, then I'd look like you. Okay, here we go. I've got through the chat. That was pretty easy. Uh, I have, again, I'm not watching how many people we've got here, how many thumbs up, all that stuff. If you can give me a thumbs up if you like the show, that's great. It always goes towards the metrics as to what YouTube does, and it's handy. It is very handy. Now, uh, because you, <laughs> that video I did on the floating shelf, I started on Friday morning around about seven in the morning, went through to 10 p.m., started around eight on Saturday morning, and I made deadline by three minutes at 10 p.m. in Australia, Eastern Daylight Time. So it, it was, I've managed it, because it takes four hours for me to upload it, because you know that's, that's how slow the internet is here. So <laughs> it was fun. At uh, around about quarter to nine or quarter to ten, I said to my wife, I've got to zap down and just make sure that the video is uploaded. And I was telling me it was going to be ready at three minutes to ten. And I try and keep things routine and regular. And uh, I was busily throwing in a couple of things. I threw in the link to Miroc because uh, it was ten minutes into the video. So hopefully no one has skipped through. Uh, <laughs> And how good is that little marking gauge the, or that little set out tool that Mirox made? He's a, he's a talent. Um, I put a link there. Go and have a look at his webpage. You will be amazed. What's the next thing? So we've got no more chat coming through, which is fine. Uh, 
Richard, well, look, let's jump, jump in and have a look at Richard's stuff straight off the bat. Where are you, Richard? There he is. So here we go. Richard, this is your time in the sun. Hey, Dave, uh, I hope you're well, keeping well. Congratulations again on 40,000 subs and 10 million views onwards and upwards. I made a bookcase for a client before Christmas and I had a lot of interest, so I thought I would share it. It's made from birch ply and tulip with recessed brass shelf strips and finished with a water-based satin varnish. The cornice molding I made on the table saw with a jig as I don't have a shaper yet. Nothing special, but looks nice, I think. I'll tell you what, I think it looks fantastic. The next picture there is uh, showing it with all the doors on and loaded up with books. You're a talent, Richard. And anyone who's in the area where he is in the UK, you need this man to go and do some work for you. That's absolutely beautiful. Lovely. What do you reckon, guys? Throw up some comment and tell Richard how good he is. He'll enjoy it. He's about to go to bed because it's uh, early in the morning over there in the UK. Right. I've got a little green light down there, which I think is saying everything is good. And... Uh, Yep, still watching. As I said, I can't see what's happening on the stream at all. So if you guys can let me know what's happening, that'd be great. Um, next thing, next thing, next thing. So as Derek is next soon. Um, what I'll do is I'm going to have a little chat. Okay, thank you. I had a laugh the other week learning, learning about Dust Deputy Cyclone from watching your videos. Anita is actually just now is driving up the road from you. Is that right, Ramison? Mark Williams, it does look nice. Doesn't he do magic work? Uh, making you blush. Good on you. Good on you. Why not? Make sure your wife watches this, Richard, so then uh, you, you might get some attaboy points. <laughs> All right. I'm going to do things slightly different right at the moment. What I'm going to do is I'm going to jump into a section that I've got set up, and it's talking about hand planes, because I used Arthur, who is my great-grandfather. I used his... Uh, uh, trying plane. Now there's a few different types of planes and I have a book. Now I've got a couple of books. Now this particular one you may want to get if you're interested in hand tools. It's a bloody good reference book. Now this page here is the one I'm going to show. If I can get it. This tells you the sizes, I'm working back to front here of course, of wood planes and steel planes and what they're called. Uh, Jamie Gorman, late start. Ugh. Off to the corner with you, Jamie, and you can come back out when I tell you. All right. Uh, in Sweden. Good. Nice work, Richard. Everyone's being nice. How cool is that? Uh, okay, so I'm going to spin the camera or go to the other camera. That might be the easiest thing to do. Camera one there it is and we'll switch it over i'll jump over there all right okay you can see me here just i'm going to tip that camera up a little that should do it that's a bit better all right now this is the plane that I was using in the video. This is Arthur's trying plane. Now, some people may comment it was a jointer. It is not a jointer. It's a trying plane. Jointers are bigger than this. But here's an interesting thing. A steel jointer is the same size or smaller. But for a timber jointer, this is actually a trying plane. Now, try this is 22 inches long. And according to my book, um, 22 inches is Nicholson 1812 and Holt Zapfel 1847. They are trying planes. In Sheffield, the Sheffield list 1910 was also a trying plane. Now, if it was a metal plane, that length, uh, according to Spears 1845 and Norris 1900, it would have been a jointing plane. And Stanley Bailey USA, or Stanley Bailey, is a jointer and also USA was a jointer. So I'm guessing Stanley Bailey, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Stanley Bailey was the English Stanley Plains and 
Stanley on its own was USA. As I say, I'm not I'm not 100% sure, but let, correct me if I'm wrong. It'll be good. Okay, I'm going to quick read. Could you show the book cover again, please? And well, I can indeed. I'll tell you it. It's Dictionary of Woodworking Tools by R. A. Salaman. S. A. L. A. M. A. N. I'll bring it over, and you can have another quick look. The revised edition. It is a great book. I love it. When I did. Um, what's in Arthur's Toolbox series, which was 30 videos long. Go back and have a look if you want to have a look. Uh, they, I bought this as a reference book. As I was going through the series, there was a, a viewer who said, Dave, you need to get this book. It's going to help you out big time. Because at the beginning of the series, it wasn't, it wasn't really me telling you what, what the plane was. It was me pulling a tool out of Arthur's Toolbox there, which was my great grandfather. I inherited all his tools. I'm throwing it up in front of everyone saying, what the hell is this? So it went from a transition as I was going through the show, as I was going through the, the series, I should say, that it went from what is this to me studying up on an item during the week and then giving it my best shot, but then also being very appreciative of a lot of people throwing in input and, and tweaking the information that I'd given and saying, yeah, well, that's correct, but also this also happened. And it was great. Some people were going off and researching like crazy. I, I loved it. It was such such an interactive, well, not really an interactive, but such a, um, a, a responsive set of videos for me to do. It was very, very enjoyable. So there you go. So that's the big fellow, which is the trying plane. This is the biggest plane that I've got, 22 inches. And then the other plane that I've got is his jack plane. Now, this is 16 and 3 quarter inches. And this is a very, very nice plane. And you'll notice that the handle drops down here. This is so you can get your hand down behind and really get the force behind the blade. This one here, you're on top. And so you don't have the, the grunt down low. Now, why do I want to do that? The jack plane was designed really for roughing things down quickly. So you could have the blade on that more exposed. And also these blades tended to be shaped convex. I think that's the word. So that there was a bit of a chop and it came up to the edges. So it wasn't it wasn't um, kind of leaving channels. It was leaving us a, a dish kind of a shape. And so you could go one direction and you come across the other way and you could reduce the thickness of timber down very quickly. Then you come along with a smoothing plane, which is the next one. Just worked my way into that one, didn't I? So this is my Stanley uh, four and a half smoothing plane. I've had this for nearly 45 years. So it's a beautiful plane. And I am thinking of doing a project soon where we do a new handle because this has got plastic handles and that's, that's original, but I've found a way of making a timber handle for it. And there are some templates out there. So I will do that in a video, not straight away, but soon enough. One of the other things about these planes, while I've got these, I'm in this area here, is that with the blade and the wedge, I use a timber mallet to tap the, the wedge in because I don't want to destroy it with a hammer. And if you want to take the blade or the wedge out, you'll notice on the back here, there's a whole lot of um, denting. I don't know if you can see it there or not. That's how you take the blade out, believe it or not. You use a mallet, you hold on, to the, hold on to the wedge and you give it a tap. Done. How cool is that? Out comes the blade and you'll see it's a bevel down in this particular one. It has a slot in here. Don't know if you can see it. Eh, you might be able to see it. There it is. You can see the slot now. And that's for the screw on the cap iron. See this stuff? That's just... <laughs> I love it. I love it. So I put it down flat on a surface, on a timber surface. Give the wedge a little bit of a tap. And you notice in that video also, I gave the blade just a little bit of a tap once the wedge was in to get it in line and running. Now that's come through too far on one side. I will fix this straight away. Here it comes. Magic. 
magic. Absolutely magic. I might play in a bit of timber with it. What have I got? I don't know if I've got anything there. I say to myself sometimes, well, not sometimes. Yeah, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. You know why? I say to myself, Dave, don't ever do anything on the live show if you haven't got it prepared or haven't actually run through it because it's going to end up going to mud. How many of you have done that? You've thought, yeah, not a problem. And you'll be showing someone how to do something and it just didn't go the way you thought it would go. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to, I'm going to stick with the plan. So it's a lovely plane. This is called a trying plane, 22 inches long, 16 three quarter inches for the jack. The little Stanley four and a half smoothing plane. It's a standard angle. It's not a low angle. And these two are both standard angles as well. This guy, my four and a half is basically 10 inches long overall. Now, why am I saying these sizes in Imperial, not metric? Well, you know, that's how I've always known planes. If you want to know how long this um, trying plane is in metric, I'm, Always helps if I turn the rule around. It is 560 millimeters long, and the jack is 425 millimeters long. There you go. Now then, the la the second last plane that I'm going to talk about today, before I move on to the fence, is my little block plane. Now it's not a fancy plane. It's a it's a number 110, and it just does a beautiful job. I use this plane so so much. And it is a low angle in comparison. See that in comparison to the smoothing plane? I don't know. If, yeah, you might be able to see it. If I put that right in front, if I sit that one there and that one there, you can see the points of the blades are at the same position. This one is way down flat. This one's up much higher. I guess this one is around 22 degrees. It'd be around that. And this one would be closer to 45. Right, block plane, I love it. Then I have this tiny, tiny, tiny little plane that I was given by Keith Cullen. Now this does a magic job of cleaning up my melamine shelving. I'll, I'll grab one because this, this is something that I can do. I'm looking for one that I haven't done yet. There's one. Okay, now this bit of melamine, I do a lot of stuff with melamine because it's handy stuff to work with, but here we go. I'm just going to chamfer it. That's finished and that is beautiful. <laughs> you won't see it from there, but take my word from it. That side is just a delight to touch. There's no sharpness on it. This side's sharp still. I have never cleaned this one off. That's what I use that little guy for, cleaning up the edges of melamine after I've done the iron-on. Now, I don't have the Conturo like Steve Innes has got, and uh, that's Innes as in Guinness, not Ines or Inns. Uh, now, the last thing I wanted to show you was the uh, right angle fence. Now, this fence here is designed for a jointer, a jointer plane, but it will go on my little Stanley here and it's magnetic slides onto there. I push it along There's a little stop. I'll bring it over so you can see it a bit better Let's see if you can see that So just here is The little stop that it pushes up against and so that is a 90 degree right angle So if I'm planning something I'm, my plane blade, my plane is not going to wobble around, you know, as you're pushing t pushing a blade along or plane along, I should say. Sometimes you're focusing on whether you're digging in too much and keeping it straight, and sometimes you're not concentrating as much. You're not you're you're relying a heap of muscle memory as to whether the blade the blade or the plane is staying flat or 90 degrees to the surface. This helps you big time. It's great. I love it. So that's those guys there. How's the time? Half past. I might jump back into the chat. The other book that I use is this one, Stanley Tools. This is the hard edition, hardcover edition. 
And this is absolutely beautiful. And it was given to me by a viewer from Rick Jackson. Dear David from Rick Jackson, January 2017. Thanks for a great YouTube channel. Uh, P.S. Give my regards to Barry. <laughs> Where would I be without Barry the Parker? I don't know. All right. Now, back over to the other camera, which is there, and I'll sit down. Okay, so guys, I'm trying to mix the show up as much as I can as we're going along. So that means I'm not going to get into the chat as much. And uh, I'm going to do a little bit of reading now. <sighs> Hilton Bond, if you were to buy one plane, what would it be? I've been asked that question. Uh, all right, so you wanted the name of the book again, was it James? Okay, here it is. Dictionary of Woodworking Tools by R.A. Salomon, and that's the revised edition. And it's a decent sized book. And they're not cheap, I'll tell you that. I got mine on Amazon. Uh, right. Now, if you want to, jump in through one of my links and have a look for the, for the book by that name in Amazon and you'll get it. Uh, where am I? Where am I? Where am I? Yes, yeah, Jack Plan, correct. Jack of all trades. Um, the German Jack is the, is the roughing one. Now, that brings me to answering... Uh, okay, 24-inch version would be a jointer, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm answering questions as well as I'm going along. Uh, thanks for doing the outside, Connor. Um, shelf, my wife said she wanted me to make one a month ago, but I didn't know how, so thanks again. Look, I'm, I'm happy to help. I got to slide back down to here. And the question was from Hilton, if I was to buy one plane, uh, which one would it be? And I've got no idea what's happening with the rest of the chat because it's just gone silly. It would be a Veritas low angle jack. Now, why would I get a Veritas low angle jack over any other low angle jacks? The thing is with the Veritas one, you can get three different blades for it that will make it convert from being just a, a low angle through to around about a 52 degrees blade I think you can put in it. So it's all on the degree of the angle of the, the blade has been sharpened to. Uh, I think they are a bevel up blade. Now then to complement that, I would probably also get their low angle block plane because you can do the same thing. They, they produce about three different blades for that particular plane. So you would have everything covered. Now be aware, the low angle jack is not cheap. They are pricey in comparison to other planes around. But the thing is, that one plane will do the job of three. So that's, that's why I'd go that way. Uh, I've had that Stanley smoothing plane, which is a standard angle for all my life that I can remember woodworking. And uh, it's been great, but it's not long enough to do any jointing with. So it's, it's fine for just cleaning up and, and making things you know, square and flat, but it's not any good for long lengths of timber. You, you will get undulation eventually with it, where the, the, the number five uh, from Veritas, yeah. it's not as good as a jointer, but man, man, do you want to spend the money on a jointer and playing? They're, they're, a, they're a heap of money. Uh, but the, as I say, the low angle jack, grab one if you can. Um, all right, uh, William Smith, uh, great question. What would it be? I don't know. Uh, Lennox, uncle of mine had a Reader's Digest collection of woodworking and mechanical manuals, but after he passed away, I couldn't find it. Have you ever heard of a collection, Dave? Not in Reader's Digest. My father had, was a, you know, as in those days, my dad was a subscriber to Reader's Digest. And we'd get the occasional book, but... Uh, no, I've, I've got a heap of uh, Woodsmith and American Woodworker magazines. I, I use those as reference points, but most of the time I'll just jump on YouTube. That you know, I'm not the only person that's got a channel out there. There's a heap of really good talent. As I said, I've referred off to, to Miroc's channel. I watch uh, Ron Polk's channel. I watch The Wood Whisperer. There's, there's a few. There's, um, 
look, there's there's a heap out there. I watch um, Nick Ferry. Nick is fantastic. He's he's someone that doesn't do a heap of videos, but when he does one, it's it's very well thought out. Uh, there's a guy in America also who does little wooden uh, stop photography, and that's how he started up. And then he's doing other work. Frank Howarth, I think his name is. Um, he's he's great to watch as well. So there's a whole lot of reference out there if you need it. But if you need to get magazines that have got some shop plans, and those kind of things, uh, Woodsmith. I use I buy the well, I don't buy it. I get to read it. The Australian Woodsmith. It's very very good. Um, Dave M, is the magnetic fence universal? Does Lee Nielsen carry one? That would be from Lee Nielsen because it's Veritas. That's it. It's called a joint fence and it is universal because it's got magnets on the back. Let's see if I can get it. And this pin here fits in. It just rides up to where the saddle in the in the plane and you can move it there's a couple of points here you can move it from one to the other depending on the plane and you can put it on the other side as well if you want to work off the right hand side of the the, um, the surface very very nice well worth buying uh, Wayne regarding Amazon when I click on the link it doesn't have an Australian link do I use USA International or is that the one I should use all right I'll address this straight away there's a lot of work in building these web pages, so I, I've grabbed everything from Amazon USA at this stage. There's some things on there you can buy for Australia, but the majority of it will be uh, stuff for the states. Now, the reason it can't come here is because a lot of companies have got agreements with countries, or companies have got agreements with other companies where they won't sell to people offshore because someone might have kind of a a franchise or a deal to be the distributor for that particular tool in a company in a country. Now the next one I'm doing, I'm working on at the moment, is a Festool and Craig link for the UK, the United Kingdom. And that should be live in the next couple of weeks. I'll get that built. And then I'll probably do one for Canada and then I'll try and also do one for uh, Germany. As far as Australia is concerned, there I can't do any of this stuff yet with Australia. They haven't opened up the Australian um, Amazon site to incorporate all the things that I can do with the American site. So give it time if you want to, click on the link, see what's there. If it lets you uh, send it over to Australia, by all means do it. There are other ways around it. If you want to, what you can do is you can have a, um, a post office box or, or a forwarding company, there's a forwarding company in uh, California, you hire a suite, and the suite's basically a, an address, and they forward the stuff onto you. Australia Post, I think, does the same kind of thing. Or if you know someone in the States, you can get it sent to them, and they can forward it onto you as well. But you have to work out whether or not it's going to be financially viable for you to do that kind of thing as well, Wayne. Some things it might be, some things it may not be. Um, because it would probably be sent by plane, where the local suppliers have everything come over in a container. It's a whole lot cheaper for them to have it shipped that way, rather than, you know, one-off items. All right, Matt uh, down Lee Valley. Yes, uh, Alan just bought the dictionary for fourteen ninety-five on Amazon. Good. Um, Connor Manor, Connor Moran. I asked last time if you made a cutting board, but you said no. Can you make one on a live stream? Well, I cleaned up a cutting board not long ago, Connor. We uh, I had a piece of camp laurel that was cut at a, a kind of a slight angle. And it looked really nice. We'd spent a lot of time putting it through the drum sander and cleaning up, cleaning up the live edge. And then we oiled it as well. So it was making a cutting board out of a solid section of timber. And it's, I'll grab it. You can have a look. <coughs> I've got it down here. I haven't totally finished it yet. But my wife loves it. She says it's probably a little bit too thick. But that's camphor laurel. It's been done with grapeseed oil, live edge. Vicky thought she might like it sliced into three sections. I said, baby, it's going to smash. It's angry. So she says it's too heavy, but I, you know, I think it's okay, but it all depends. You know, it all depends on the person using it. If, if they like it or, and it's too heavy, they won't use it, will they? 
All right. Um, <clears throat> how, Haruko, how large is your workspace? It is 11 meters by five meters this way, and there's a six by six meter garage off it. And out the end is another five meters by nearly three meters undercover for the outside machinery that I use. Remember, I'm a retired builder. There's a whole lot of stuff out there, the compressor, my scaffolding material, all that is out there. Lawnmower, things that, a little excavator, things like that. Uh, Linux, Amazon does ship to Australia, just some products are restricted. Correct. Dep yes, depends on the main. Cool. From Connor, me and my friend making cutting boards for fun and just to make some money. Well, why not? I've got to get back into the uh, things here. Uh, I, what's the count? As I say, I've got no idea how many people are watching. Um, it's, a, it's good to know because it lets me know whether or not I'm doing the things that you guys want to see. Uh, Carl, belated greetings from Northern Kentucky. Okay, so you need to go into the corner, Carl, and you can tell the other guy that's there, he can come back into the room now and keep watching. <laughs> uh, what have we got next? <clears throat> um, so we'll cross that off as I'm going. So I've got Derek Lark is the last item from a viewer. So we've got that. We've done the hand planes. We've done that. Talked about the chat. Um, where did he get the bench tops from? Video on the floating shelf. Leaves me with a couple of things. So Derek's mocks and vice. Now Derek is making some things up and he's also get enlisted the talent of John Lafferty who is watching as well. Now. I have to come down to there. So I'm going to throw on a video. You hear the cockatoos in the background? They're noisy bastards. <laughs> and they'd like to eat houses. They're, you know, come to Australia. We've got animals that will kill you, eat you. And we've got animals that will eat your house. <laughs> but we resist. Uh, I think Steve Innes said to someone that... Uh, we're all convicts. <laughs> so we're used to having it hard. All right, I'll slip, slide this one over. And this is Derek Lark. Hi, Dave. Photos as promised. Got the Moxon handles, 3D printed or 3D printed handles from John Lafferty at Yellow Box Shed this morning and started the project. I'm so lucky as John is only about half an hour's drive from where I live. A real inspiration to come up with the innovative ideas to make with 3D printing or CNC. Uh, John should be able to supply the handles if anyone else wants to do one. They are really a good size and will give nice leverage. I went with blue to match your shirt. <laughs> he says, just kidding. I don't think you're just kidding. I reckon that's true. Uh, my bench dogs are blue, so they are easy to find and in the mess. So I got John to make these to match. The design uses 5 8 inch UNC threaded rods and nuts from Bunnings. Also, if you buy the half inch UNC washer and drill the center hole or file it if you have the patience, to five eighths, then they fit perfectly in the back of the handle where the lock nut sits. Now, if this video starts looping again, don't worry about it. I'm looking up, there's a fair bit to read here. If you could find affordable Acme nuts and thread rods in Australia, I would go that way. For the jaws, I just grabbed some four by two DAR plantation ash from my local builder supply hardware, and there are lots of options. Uh, if I had some six inch Merbo decking, I considered laminating up and even laminated sheets of ply are common uh, on many builds. I'm going to switch this back over. In reality, I probably should have gone to 6x2, but I think this will work okay as it will be clamped on the top of my bench when in use. Also, for anyone contemplating building one, I'm using some 20mm electrical conduit to sleeve the timber so the UNC rod doesn't chew the hardwood out. Much cheaper to replace the conduit now and then. Hope to make the stream tomorrow, which is obviously today. I hope you're here, Derek. Uh, stay tuned for some photos when we get finished. Regards, Derek. Isn't that fantastic? I love it. The, one of the great things that I made, I made a comment during the week on the Facebook page, which is the Dave Stanton live stream uh, page, uh, which Steve Ennis wants to convert to the Stanton village. Uh, and we were all wondering what person from the village people Steve would be and some of the other characters. But <laughs> enough said. Uh, and uh, I'm just quickly reading there. John's making a comment that the handle can be customized to any size, which is great. Uh, Dave, you don't like the Australian snakes. Well, unlucky, they're, they're part of the country. 
That's the way it goes. They're fine. They're fine. If you don't annoy the snakes, they won't annoy you. One, you, there's a couple that you keep away from. Brown snakes are not good. They are very aggressive. But black snakes are fine. You know, the big red belly blacks, they're, um, they're lovely. You don't have, it's just, it's a bit scary to look at them. You, know, you think, oh, it's going to get me. No, they're more happy having a sunbake and off they'll go. There could be a threat to bury the pug, but you know, not to people really, unless you go and tick them off. Then they'll bite you and that'll be that. Um, okay, uh, Linux, you know, a woodworker should need, should not need DAR if they have the tools. Correct, I agree with you, but in Australia, a lot of the timber that we buy is already dimensioned. It's very hard to get rough sawn, and a lot of the time, the rough sawn slabs are more expensive than if you just go and buy DAR material already. And if it's DAR, you can have a look at it and you can work out whether or not the grain is good and whether it's going to do the job for you. Uh, I've had situations where slabs haven't been the correct uh, moisture content and it's ended up being a bit of a nightmare where I would have rather just bought DAR that's already been seasoned and, you know, away we go. Right. Derek, we've looked after Derek and here's Mox and Vice. Now, the next thing I want to do is I want to talk about sanding the plasterboard that we did the other week or last week. I put the top coat on last week and I'm going to show you, I'm not going to show you using any of the Festool gear, sanding it. I don't have a Planex, which is the, um, the large head sander specifically designed for uh, sanding plasterboard, the joints. There's also a thing called a giraffe. There's a whole heap of things that you can use to do that. But I'm going to show you how to set up a sand, plasterer sanding block. Now, this is a wooden float, plastic handle, couple of clamps either end, and then it's rubber backed all the way down here. So it will, will float over the joint nicely. Now, these things, ideally, you put a gauze on. There's a, there's a kind of a, a sandpaper gauze that you can put in, and they're a set size sheet. I'll switch the machine over to the other side, the other camera, and I'll show you what I'm going to do with this one. All right, I'm going to move these guys off here. Aren't these beautiful planes? Why wouldn't anyone like or enjoy woodworking? It's, it's such, a, um, such a tactile, organic thing to do. It's, it's easy to shape. Don't get me wrong, I also enjoy metalwork. I spent six months in a blacksmith shop uh, when I was younger, and I picked up a heap of stuff from the old blacksmiths, and I enjoy welding, I enjoy cutting steel. You'll find also with steel, because there's no grain, sometimes it's a little bit easier to, to, to work with. Coffee. What's the next thing? That's right. Um, now that I'm here. Now, I buy sandpaper in a roll. This is the stuff I get, I think in Australia, it's from a guy called the Sandpaper Man. Now, on the back, it's got written what grit it is. This is 400 grit, so 400 bits of grain or, or abrasive. What, what else would you call it? I normally call it grit. Um, it'll come to me as I'm going along per square inch. So 400 per square inch. 80 grit, 80 pieces bits of um, stuff <laughs> per square inch. All right, now the reason I'm using this this way is because if I was to go sideways, it's not going to make it all the way out and up the side here. I need to clamp it. Yes, they are. Uh, do you use imported wood? Linux looks like a concrete smoother. Yep, what kind of camera switching box do you use? Your videos are professional. Uh, <laughs> they are not lovely. My snakes are lovely, they're fine. Just got to get used to them. Now, the good thing about this paper as well, as I said, because it's a roll, I can pull it out along there and I can cut it to length. And it's not hard to cut. Done. And that is a perfect 90 degree cut. It's amazing stuff. Now, I don't want it that length. I'm oh, sorry, I want it that length, but I don't want it that width. So I'm going to put it on there. And again, done. How cool is that? It is so easy. I love this stuff. 
Now I'm going to undo the clamp and give it a little tear at the front because I want it to go inside. Raise that up. The only problem with it being a roll is it wants to roll itself back up. So a slider in there. What I'll do is I'll tear it a little bit more down the side because the nut has thickness. But how easy is that? Look. So I'll slide that under there. This is that very case that I was talking about that I should have really done this prior. But it's going in lovely. There we go. Tighten it up. Aim it straight. So I've tightened up the clamp at the front here. Pull it out along the board. Do a bit of a cut here. And another one there. Loosen this clamp off. As I say, the thing with the ETS, why I'm not doing it with the Festool ETS, is that it is, it can be too aggressive, it, it's very fast, and it's a smaller diameter. So it can jump down in the holes and you, you won't have the control. We're just about there. Okay, tighten this one up. There we go. Done. All fixed. Now, where's my board? There it is. Now, you're not going to see it. I'm going to switch the camera around the other way, see if this one's going to work any better. And down. It may, it may be working slightly better. Let's have a look. There we go. That might be a little bit easier. All right. Now, I do wear a helmet with this. So I'm putting, this stuff is super fine. This is my helmet that I wear. Again, I love this. These days it's called a Trend Airshield Pro. It was a Pure Light Extreme when I bought mine down here. Uh, but this is seven years old. So that gives you an idea as to how good they are. And it's John Lafferty made a um, printed up a 3D battery case for it. And uh, away you go. So I'm going to turn her on. You might hear it in the background a little bit. See the dust? I put a little bit too much in this spot here. Beautiful. Done. Very nice. I'll switch cameras again. So people call me the alien. But that, and there is, this is covered in dust. And I'm breathing like normal. It's not a worry. I, I love this helmet.
I've had people say to me, Dave, would you do it again? Would you buy it again? In a heartbeat. Not a problem. I first saw one of those being used in a joinery shop at Lawson in the Blue Mountains, a place called Branches Timbercraft. And uh, <laughs> as soon as I saw it, the guy had a beard. And as soon as I thought, saw it, I thought, oh, I've got to have one of those. Because an ordinary dust mask, it leaks all around the edge here when, I, when I'm breathing because I've got a beard, you know, it can't seal. There's smaller ones that you can get, little 3M models. And there's bigger ones, you know, with the hose down the back, the big 3Ms. And they're fine, except for I'm, I've had other ones that had hoses down the back and I found it a little bit restrictive, you know, it held the helmet still when my head was moving around. They've come a long way since there, but uh, that's the way that I've, I went that one. The ones with the dust pack and all that stuff below, about twice the price of those things. Anyway, I'll switch the camera back over here. And we're just about done for the day. Well, that's gone quickly. I'll tip that camera up a little bit because it's a little bit of a better image. There we go. Right, now, no dust extraction, <laughs> no. Uh, 61 thumbs up and 96 eyes on. Good deal, thank you, Peter. Thanks for letting me know. No, there's no dust extraction with that hand sander, although Festool do make a hand sander that they, you can plug your, their dust extractors onto. Did you know that? Pretty amazing stuff. I may have to look at getting one. I don't know why, maybe because I would just like to own one. <laughs> uh, where are we up to? What's the next thing? So we've done the sanding of the top coat and we'll do a little bit more chat. I've covered everyone that I was talking about wanting to uh, talk about what they'd sent in. I shall have a look here. Hilton, Dave, you're making a mess in the workshop with all that dust. Yeah, I'll just look. I'll get the little dust extractor out and I'll clean all that up in two seconds. It's fine. Uh, love my trend needs better filters, HEPA filters. Does it, Steve? Well, maybe you could uh, try and get something like that happening. Uh, Hakura, as a guy with a beard, that's a must get gear. Yes, Wayne Jones, for all those in odds, the big green hardware store sells those sanding floats, a uh, very handy tool. The big green hardware store would be Bunnings, I'm guessing that's what she's saying there, Wayne. I'll tip this down a little. Uh, Connor, how many times do you live stream? Once a week, Connor, same time every week. Uh, the only time it'll change around is because I've gone to, uh, we've gone off daylight savings and the UK and USA and a whole lot of other countries come on to daylight savings. There's one place in, um, in Australia, there's a couple of places that don't do daylight savings and that is uh, Queensland. Uh, they're a little bit backward up there. They like to stay, you know, well, the thing is they're closer to the equator, so it doesn't really concern them as much. But the further south you go in Australia, from south of the equator, the shorter the days get in winter and the longer the days get in summer. So I always say to people, I think they've got daylight saving around the wrong way. I would rather have daylight saving during winter. Now you think about it. In winter, it's dark in Tasmania around four o'clock in the evening. If they had daylight saving in Hobart in winter, it would be five o'clock by the time it's getting dark. During summer, instead of uh, pushing the boundary in its summer, instead of being, say, going dark at six o'clock, it's now going dark at seven, wouldn't it be better to stay at six o'clock? And just balance things out a little bit. I don't know. I had one person say to me, Matt, uh, Matt Hargrave said, Dave, I enjoy the summer barbecues and not getting dark until half past eight in the evening. Well, that's another way of looking at it as well. All right, where are we up to? Uh, Peter, you can go long. We won't complain. <laughs> Jason, cheers, mate. Jason from the States, my best bug is from down under. I served in the US Navy with them. Oh, your best bud. Jay Parra, good show as always, Peter. Um, Lysiak, you, uh, where are we? And WA don't. Right, Connor. So what time is it there? It's, it started at 11 a.m. on Sunday. So if you work out your times. Now my phone that I recently got has these little, uh, this little app that helps me out. Now I'll show it to you. 
I'll tell you exactly what time it is in different places. I go to the clock, world clock, and this is what's happening around the world. And if I slide it up, this is the time right now around the world. Oop, turn it sideways. So I can type in any city and it will tell me what time it is. And it takes into account daylight saving and everything. I love it. What have we got there? Um, okay, John DeBess, three hours and 30 years behind. David M, you want darkness in Tasmania because the little devil do keep him, keep him away. Not really. The poor old Tassie de devil has got a, a face cancer problem. So they're running the risk of becoming extinct, Tasmanian devil. Uh, Sue Connor, Sue, Sue B. Oh, Connor, it's almost noontime, but it's Sunday. Jason uh, met my best bud. Of course he did. Hilton Bond. Uh, guys, I want my dust collector to start automatically when I start my machine. Is there a system I can buy for this to work? Yes, there is, but you'd have to go to something from the States and make sure it's 240 volt. I purchased a switch as a spare part for one of the machines that's dedicated to work with a magnetic shut on and shut off switch, which most dust extractors have. Uh, it cost me a couple hundred dollars. And fortunately, well, or unfortunately, I don't know which is the case, the remote for my TV up on the wall there, if I hit the source button, it turns that on. So there you go. Um, but have a look around, and I think someone responded to you on the on the Facebook uh, chat as well to let you know what was happening there. Matthew, uh, if you are careful with the taping knife, uh, a Festool Planex is grossly excessive. The simple hand sanders you have there is plenty. Here in the states, we use pole sanders that have a flat pad on. All right, much like a bull float in concreting, I guess. Uh, Connor, it's 8 p.m. Right, Graham, so eight in Western Australia, three hours behind. Long staffs of country, 1 a.m. in the UK. Yeah, the, my show starts 12 midnight in the UK for you guys. At the moment, it'll go to 2 a.m. further down the track when daylight savings switches around. From We go an hour backwards, you will go an hour forwards. Um, everyone's telling me the difference in the time. Uh, a double switch, a double swivel that keeps the pad flat to the joint. All right, thank you very much, everyone. For watching and for just putting up with me, putting up with me and my videos have a look if you haven't had a look at the video on the floating garden shelf have a look at it i run through all the different machines i use some hand tools i use some um, the, some of the big machines here i use the pocket hole system now the reason i use the craig screws on that job as well is because they are a washer head they're not a countersink now because i laminated those two pieces of decking together if i put a countersink screw in there, it would act as a wedge and want to separate the, the two pieces of timber and it wouldn't have ended up nice at all. So that's why I use the Craig blue coat screws. Someone said to me, Dave, you haven't used the blue coat screws on the join. And he's correct because the blue coat screws that I had were at two and a half inch. I've got to get some more that are a bit, little bit shorter. I will crack that joint open and put the blue coat screws in before I paint it. So thanks for watching everybody. I hope you have a good week. Stay safe. Um, be nice to each other, and I shall see everyone next week, I hope. See you later. Bye.